Good morning, everyone. Uh, and thanks, everyone, who put the conference together. It's already been uh, such an incredible opportunity to learn from the first two presenters. It's, it's actually very nerve-wracking to follow both of you, Darlene and Karen. Uh, I'm working on sort of the, the subset of a subset of a subset of citizen science uh, in my dissertational research, and now I get to bore you with that for the next half hour. So thank you for being a willing set of humans to hear about this. Um, so I'm, I'm sort of presenting some notes toward a dissertation. I'm in the sort of abstract impressionist phase of things, so there's some hazy borders. Uh, we're, we're, I'm working toward the photorealist version of this work, so bear with me. Uh, my interest is in what my advisor Marianne Krasny calls civic ecology practices, what we also know as grassroots volunteer stewardship. Hey, I didn't see you here yet. Hey, hey. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, I'm curious about how volunteers or people working in small two or three or four or five staffed organizations are uh, helping to manage um, urban ecosystems in some way. So in a nutshell, this is directly from a paper that Marianne wrote with our colleague Keith Tidball. Civic ecology practices are self-organized stewardship initiatives often taking place in cities. Those are the ones I'm interested in. These initiatives have allegedly positive outcomes for individuals, communities, and local ecosystems and thus represent a change in thinking, we think. Um, they reflect local cultures, um, and they're successful forms of partnerships with government agencies and nonprofits, and we all, we do this. This is, I'm already stating the obvious for this career. Um, and I was very lucky enough to get some funding early on uh, in coming to Cornell to look at how some civic ecology practices in New York City we're using basic forms of, we'll call it citizen science, to evaluate the outcomes of their work. Um, and I was taken by the concept of public participation in scientific research uh, because Jennifer Shirk and colleagues at the uh, Lab of Ornithology at Cornell were trying to figure out different kinds or different levels or different gradations of participation by scientists and non-scientists in these different knowledge-making processes. So basically what I did was go through and look at a bunch of different orgs that were collecting data about what they do and try to figure out where they fell on that spectrum. And it turned out that many of them were actually not working with formal scientists or researchers at all. They had just sort of baked up their own data collection methods, sometimes in response to the need to do that for evaluation work on a grant. Uh, and they were collecting basic forms of data in order to inform um, improvements in their practice over time. Um, but it just didn't seem, it, it was sort of frustrating because a lot of those organizations that I reached out to actually weren't doing anything like this or they uh, experienced a struggle in trying to collect data about what they were doing. Um, but it seemed as if they were dealing with other forms of knowledge in their work. They weren't just sort of blindly going about, um, you know, what, what is it, navigating the ocean with a blindfold on. So, um, so my work conceptually has been trying to map out these different kinds of experiences. So what I'm just going to stick to with classic citizen science, this idea of people participating in scientific knowledge production, uh, you have the expert, sort of what we think of as the, the lab scientist, um, and the purpose is to create scientific truth, generally. We're dealing with uh, ideal types here, so bear with me as I condense it all down. But the idea is to create reliable, repeatable, um, parsimonious truths that all tie together. Uh, and the product, generally is the journal article. Um, and the participant then in this case, uh, we have a birder here, I think we all agree that's sort of the archetypical citizen scientist at this point. Uh, the participant is thought of as somebody who is not a scientist. All right, so, but are there other forms of knowledge production happening in these kinds of practices? Um, so I looked at what my colleagues at the Public Lab for Open Technology and Science have been working on. Uh, and here we see them rigging some uh, inflatable weather balloons, some helium balloons, uh, with a hacked digital camera uh, in order to monitor uh, degradations in environmental quality. In this case, in particular, their claim to fame was with monitoring uh, oil landfall during the BP oil spill uh, of a handful of years ago. Um, their aim, the product then, was uh, to change legislation or to enforce existing legislation uh, or to regulate, essentially. Uh, and the purpose is, to, is for justice, in essence, or for governance. Uh, and so we see these kinds of knowledge production practices that are not about creating scientific knowledge, but about creating knowledge for governance, let's say, generally. 
Um, but I've identified a third category that I think um, is related, but worth parsing out in order to let it work on its own terms, in order to understand it on its own terms. And that's knowledge production for management, sort of the more day-to-day, week-to-week questions about what's working and what's not working over time. So for example, we see volunteers doing uh, tree planting here. They're the participants. Um, and we often think of the knowledge that comes from adaptive management or co-management or the combination of the two. The codification of that or the product of that is this idea of best practices written down. And I'm going to start calling this the Amelia Bedelia effect. Because when you end up trying to create this algorithm of best practices step by step, what often happens is a loss in translation. Um, so that when you ask uh, someone to pick up that protocol who hasn't been involved in the culture of creating that protocol originally, sometimes a mess comes up. And so I actually think that um, the knowledge that results from these practices is encoded in the landscape itself or in the site itself and in the practice itself. And I'll dig into that in a little bit. What's the purpose of this? Arguably resilience or sustainability or improvements in practice over time. I've wrestled with what to put in this box. Um, it used to say adaptation, but that's not quite a purpose. It's sort of a method. Um, and then the expert, of course, is the expert land manager who straddles the border between expert scientists um, and non-scientist often has training from a research university, uh, typically has an advanced degree, if not a doctorate. Um, and so I'm calling this knowledge creation for action. Again, these often overlap and intertwine. We take insights from science in order to inform policy making and certainly to inform action. But sometimes, uh, as researchers in the science, technology, and society field have demonstrated, uh, the governance line and definitely the action line do not have time to wait for science, and this is exactly what Karen was saying toward the tail end of her talk. Sometimes we have to make useful knowledge, reliable knowledge, without waiting for um, the peer-reviewed journal article to come out 10 years later. Uh, and what we're finding is then there are gradations of participation. We go back in the sort of the science line. There are these different forms of, uh, of participatory knowledge production uh, that Shirk and others have um, identified as these five different models. You have contractual, for, um, communities going to a professional scientist and asking for help, much like in the Flint water crisis case, uh, all the way to the collegial where there are um, no scientists involved in the knowledge production. But the knowledge itself is then fed back into something like a peer-reviewed journal article. On the governance side, I think we're seeing something more like the classic ladder of participation that came from Arnstein in the 60s and 70s, um, because it's much more about decision making um, at, in the sort of in, in the deliberation of governance rather than necessarily just knowledge production. It's baked in together. Um, my area of focus then is in that white empty box, which is to understand how people who don't identify as experts are creating useful and reliable knowledge in their environmental management practices, in particular in those civic ecology practices. I like the city stuff. Uh, so this is my exploratory research question to begin with. How are civic ecology practitioners creating and managing useful knowledge in their day-to-day. -day. This is an example of a community garden in Brooklyn. Um, and here's one example of how they're starting to do that using a protocol uh, developed by a colleague, Mara Gittleman, the organization Farming Concrete, to weigh and track produce that's coming out of those gardens. Uh, this is the requisite method slide. Uh, I'm a qualitative researcher. I ask questions and I hang out with people and I try to understand what's going on rather than surveying them. Uh, I'm also a constructivist. I don't necessarily believe that what I'm putting out there is the one truth. I think it's one way of slicing and dicing what I'm seeing out there. So I did interviews and focus groups and participant observation. I also come with about 10 years worth of professional practice in the sort of grassroots civic ecology world. So I just got to hang out with friends and ask them what they were doing for the most part for my field research. Um, and worked on three cases of civic ecology practice. The first. Um, is a street tree stewardship initiative uh, led by the Gowanus Canal Conservancy in central Brooklyn. Uh, it's a group that, amongst other things, is coordinating volunteers to take care of roughly 1,000, 1,500 street trees um, in a heavily polluted watershed. Um, their goals uh, include reducing combined sewage overflow by creating permeable surface with uh, tree pits. Um, the focus, of course, is on keeping those trees alive. The second group uh, is a bit more uh, professionalized than the volunteers at Gowanus Canal Conservancy. Uh, it's a crew of paid staff at the Bronx River Alliance, uh, also in New York City, that are working to manage invasive plants uh, along that riparian corridor 
um, in uh, combination with uh, government scientists in New York City. Uh, and the third is a new community garden that was created within the past two years, uh, also in the South Bronx, called the Kelly Street Garden. It's a sort of hybrid community garden. It exists behind a row of buildings uh, that were recently renovated by a nonprofit developer, uh, but access to the garden is open to the entire community. Um, so all three of them are asking questions about what works in their practice. Some of them are using formal data collection methods to then reflect on what's working and what's not working and have critical conversations about how to change their practices over time. Um, but by hanging out with them, I started to realize that my refined research questions were these. First, sort of what is this epistemic culture in each of these three cases? What strategies are these practitioners using to create and share and manage knowledge of their practices? Um, and my work sort of skirts the boundary between learning and research, um, where a lot of the learning that's happening in these cases is original learning that might as well be called research. It's not learning something that's already established fact. It's sort of when we say, my research, through my research, I learned, et cetera, right? It's people making discoveries in practice. Uh, the second set of questions that I had was specifically about outcomes monitoring efforts in these cases. How exactly are practitioners collecting and analyzing data in their practice for monitoring-based adaptation? How does it work? These are some of the few cases of civic ecology practice where people are using some kind of protocol in order to collect data. I wanted to know how that was going down. The third set of questions uh, are geographic and cartographic. How are, practitioner, how are practitioners specifically using spatial knowledge and cartography to construct useful knowledge of their practice. All of them were concerned with where things are and how they move over time in place. So preliminary findings on the first question. Um, what strategies do practitioners use to create and manage knowledge of their practices? The first thing that I found was uh, this instance of what we call legitimate peripheral participation in communities of practice, which is a fancy way of saying learning by doing together, right? Um, people are spending time together in the community garden and discovering that they are, over time, becoming gardeners. It's part of their cultural identity um, to become a gardener, and in the process, they're learning gardening together from each other. Um, and they're encoding those practices, they're codifying those practices um, through stories, through sitting down together and critiquing each other's work, or just sort of doing the typical thing when you're in the community garden or you're hanging out doing street tree stewardship with your neighbors and saying, come here, come here, let me show you what I've done. Um, that essentially starts to create an actual cultural practice where the learning and the knowledge production are just part of a larger suite of, um, of cultural practices. The second thing that we see is a practice of importing and reconstructing knowledge from outside sources. In each of these cases, volunteers or even staff are going and taking training, they're going to workshops, um, they're trying to learn from other places that have done the same kind of work and importing that knowledge from other places to what they're doing. But this is that Amelia Bedelia effect. Um, what I saw in a lot of these practices was the, the large uh, binder filled with dittos and worksheets and handouts and tip sheets from those uh, workshops that no one ever looks at again. And when the learning's actually happening is up in number one, when they're just out there learning by mistakes. Um, so there's a bit of a translation issue going on, despite, in particular in New York City, where we have a lot of technical assistance providers that are offering workshops and training courses, it doesn't necessarily pour it over. Once you get to the actual garden or out on the street taking care of your trees, you end up having to figure it out anyway. And then the third, of course, is this idea of data collection and outcomes monitoring. All three of those cases are using formally developed protocols um, to learn more about what they're doing, to collect data in a more traditional sort of citizen science way um, and reflect critically on their work. Uh, so then zeroing in on the idea of data collection and outcomes monitoring, um, I've identified three different actors at play uh, in that process. Um, and they don't necessarily always talk to one another, unfortunately. Um, and so we have some translation issues between these three. The first is the idea of a tool patron. We usually start with someone who's somewhat on the periphery of the practice saying, hey, wait a minute, wouldn't it be great if they could collect data about what they do? That often happens without asking the they whether or not they want to collect data or what they would like to collect data about. But there is this person or group of people or an entity that decides it would be really great to get some original data uh, about the street tree stewardship or the community gardens. Uh, and then they hire 
a tool maker, someone who will develop a set of protocols that are ostensibly easy to use if you just follow the step by step um, to hand off to the people who actually do the practice, the tool user. Uh, and those practitioners usually turn around and say, well, who wants to know? Um, there's always a little bit of doubt or distrust about the idea of having to collect data for some other source. And so the failure or success of outcomes monitoring, data collection out for outcomes monitoring and civic ecology practices hinges on the communication between these three stakeholders in that process. More often than not, I, I wouldn't go so far as to say failure, but the speed bumps or road bumps um, come from a lack of understanding between the three. And so I'm trying to investigate that. Uh, the third piece, which is not all that well developed yet, and all I have to observe, is that all three of those practices are trying to figure things out cartographically and spatially. There's a lot of map drawing and map making, and it's being done in an informal and non-expert way, um, not necessarily using GIS or even QGIS or even Google Earth, but just pen and paper and a printout in order to make spatial sense of what's working and what's not working. And so I'm trying to understand that a bit better right now. So what are the implications for urban forestry? Um, I think I'm, I'm basically parroting everything that Karen said. Um, first is to treat stewardship and civic ecology practices like the knowledge intensive practices that they are um, that need and merit knowledge management, much like we would think about knowledge management in a large organization, for profit or nonprofit. It takes smarts to do this work. Um, and it takes, it, it, in, in the practice of doing this work, People are creating knowledge all the time. It might not necessarily be what we identify as citizen science-based knowledge. Uh, it might be storytelling-based knowledge. It might be sharing practices over time. But the idea is that this isn't dumb work, and we need to start treating it like smart work and investing in um, helping people reflect critically on uh, the intelligence necessary to do the work well. The second is to broaden the scope of interest from citizen science and urban forestry to knowledge production writ large. Um, that it's not just about collecting the data, but it's also about the learning that happens in those communities of practice and the sharing that happens. Uh, third, I think we need to find ways to make monitoring an inherent part of the stewardship or management practice. And this goes back to the idea of um, sailors not thinking twice about collecting data while they're out on their voyage. It's just what they do. It's, it's part of being a sailor um, because it's going to improve the experience of sailing over time. Um, what we find right now is that often we sort of approach civic ecology practitioners after the fact and say, hey, wouldn't it be great if you could collect this data? And again, they sort of turn around and say, well, who wants to know? Um, I often find myself saying, I think you want to know. Um, and then a sort of critical conversation ensues after that. But that's the point. It needs to be, they need to feel as if they need the data or they need the new insights into their practice in order to keep improving their practice over time. Otherwise, it's an add-on, and very often then the data that comes out of it doesn't speak to the practice itself. Uh, and with that, I'll wrap up and just thank my committee and all of my participants and colleagues for putting up with me over the past few years as I try to figure this stuff out. Thanks, everyone. That's a great question. Uh, Farming Concrete is an organization that started um, by trying to help community gardeners in New York City measure the produce that they grew year to year. Uh, as a result of a larger initiative called Fibro Farm, the protocols that they had available to community gardeners went from just being about measuring produce to measuring a number of other alleged benefits of community gardening, including social cohesion, um, increased awareness of uh, the benefits of nutritious eating that comes from spending time in community gardens, mood changes that result from spending time in community gardens, um, and then more environmental things like weighing the compost that comes out of the community garden. So there's now a 15 protocol toolkit uh, that's free to the public along with a data portal uh, on the Farming Concrete website. The community garden in the Bronx is using some of those protocols uh, not just to measure how much they grow, but whether or not people are feeling better about their lives when they come in, when they leave the community garden, after coming into the community garden, um, and the number of events, the number of public events that they sponsor, and the number of people that are impacted by them. <laughs>
I think it's fair to say most community gardens in New York City have tested their soil at this point, and there are a number of outlets for them to do it. Um, I don't know that that insight is necessarily helping them to adapt their practices. Most of the community gardens in New York City know that they have to start with raised beds no matter what. Um, in some cases, the soil testing is just, just to know as an afterthought, but they're already using best practices to avoid uh, contamination to begin with. Thank you again. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.